Good everyone. I trust you had a, a warm and happy Fourth of July yesterday. 227 years ago yesterday, our fathers declared their independence from the British crown. In a world where the great powers were Great Britain, Spain, France, I mean, these countries in those days, these were the dominant world powers. Their navies controlled the seas. They dominated the world. Even Portugal was a major power. You know, they're the ones that eventually colonized and took control of Brazil, the biggest country, I guess, on the continent of South Africa. Not only them, but the Netherlands, the, the Dutch, had great sailing fleets, sailed the world, and were a power to be reckoned with at the time this country came into existence, whenever we declared our independence from Great Britain as 13 little colonies. And I was wondering if the Founding Fathers, when they came together and they signed that Declaration of Independence, I mean, they had, they had had it up to here with the, with the Crown, and they were going to do it, but I wonder if it ever imagined a time when rising from those 13 colonies would come the greatest power the world has ever seen. Greater even now than the British Empire, Perhaps greater than the British Empire at its greatest? Well, that's another question. You really, before you arrive at that conclusion, should really look at the British Empire when it was at its greatest, but it's a long way from that now. How did that happen? It isn't natural resources. Africa has us beaten hands down in that regard. They've got more natural resources than most of the rest of the world combined. Russia has enormous natural resources. You have all the Asian continent. Natural resources are plentiful in many other places in the world. And it isn't just democracy. We're the world's oldest democracy, which is hard to get your mind around in a way, but we're far from the old, only one. And candidly, it's a little bit spooky when you consider the implications of from 13 little colonies on the east coast of this continent who declared their independence from the crown on only 227 years ago has arisen a colossus that stands astride the world, and I don't think they could ever have imagined it. If it wasn't size, wasn't population, natural resources, or anything of that sort, what was it? Because it is really kind of hard to look at what has happened with this country and explain it by any rational course of thought or anything you would apply to it. Now, of course, the Founding Fathers believed that they had God's blessing on what they were doing. They believed in God. They called on God for His blessing. And they proceeded assuming they had it. And candidly, if you look back over the history of our country, it's kind of hard to argue that they did not. Now, when I got to this place last night when I was jotting down my notes, for some reason, words from the Gettysburg Address came to mind. And the Internet being what it is, and so I had my laptop in my lap, I punched up a website and found immediately the Gettysburg Address. And I was stunned. I knew it, but I was stunned once again at how short it is. I was able on one, just on one screen of my laptop, an ordinary courier type from a typewriter, it was right there. It was all there on one screen. And it won't take very long, so I want to read you the Gettysburg Address today. I may have a comment or two as the Spirit moves me as I go along, but it's, it's something to really think about. In fact, the first words, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, is in itself sobering. Eighty, a mere 87 years after this country was founded. Already we were a big country. Already we had come far across the continent. But our future was in doubt. A mere 87 years into our history. There was a real question, even down to the Battle of Gettysburg and beyond, as to whether or not the Union would hold together and whether or not we would continue to be a nation or whether we'd be two or whether we would be whatever. You know, providence would have us to be as time goes on. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived can endure, can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this, but in a larger sense, 
We cannot dedicate. We cannot consecrate. We cannot hallow this ground. These brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The, little, the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated to the here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus so far nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave that last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. That this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. And I wonder as I read this, if President Lincoln understood how close he was to stating what God really wanted for us. How close he was to stating what God wanted for his people, that we as a nation should live free under God. That's what Israel, you know, what God wanted for Israel until they demanded a king. You remember the story? They had lived for many years in their country without a king. They had no centralized government. They had centralized worship at the temple. But, of course, every man worshiped and prayed to God wherever he was. But the real worship of God had a focus at only one place, and that was at the tabernacle, which they constructed, and which I think at that time may have been in Shiloh. And so it was that during this period of time, they had no king. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. It was a tough, tough time throughout their history, and a lot of things went bad. And finally, they came to Samuel, and they asked for a king. It grieved Samuel. He cried to God all night about it, and God told Samuel, he says, Don't worry about it. They have not rejected you. They have rejected me that I should not reign over them. This was what God had originally wanted. No king. Not even a centralized government, mind you. Every man being the head of his own family, living under God, a righteous, holy life. This is what God originally wanted. And then he told Samuel to protest to the people exactly how much freedom they were going to lose when he gave them a king. That section of it, following on Super Samuel 8, I won't read it to you today, is, is really sobering. Because he says, I want you to understand this. This is what's going to happen to you. And laid it all out in great detail about standing armies, about a draft, about taxes, about conscription. All of the bad things that were going to happen to them as a people as a result of them demanding a king. He said, it's coming. Just bank on it. And I thought about this and I thought, you know, the yearning for freedom is as old as the desire to take freedom away. They seem to rise in the heart of a man at precisely the same time. Down through time, there has been a constant struggle between the desire of man to be free and the desire of men to control. There has been a constant struggle between the desire of men to be free and the desire of men to control the behavior of other men. Twice in his epistle, James refers to the law of God as a law of liberty. And it's really worth taking a hard look at this. He calls it the law of liberty with conscious forethought. He says this, chapter, James chapter 1, verse 22. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass, a mirror. For he looks at himself, and he goes his way, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. The law of liberty. And I want you to think about this. This is, this is really pretty important. He does not refer to the law as an administration. He doesn't refer to it as a controlling element. 
He doesn't control it and indicate in the law as something that men will use to create an administration and structure and all this. He doesn't have that at all. It's a mirror. There are another metaphor in the Bible about the law. Remember it? He says, your word is like a light unto my feet and a lamp to my path. In both of these metaphors, what is it that the law does? It enables us to see something that we otherwise could not see. Without a mirror, you can't see yourself. Without a light in the dark, you can't see your path and where you're putting your feet. In other words, the function of the law of liberty is to enable you to see what you could not otherwise see. Men have a hard time keeping that straight, but it's important, and I hope that we'll ever forget it. Now, have you ever noticed in reading this, it's a solitary act that this man is doing. He, me, I look into a mirror and I see myself, that mirror being the law of God. I don't ask you what you think about the, how the law applies to my life. I don't ask you to tell me what to do relative to the law of God. I go to no man for a, for a question. I look into the law of liberty and I see myself. It is a solitary act that one commits here. Just like in the time of Judges, before there was a king in Israel, a man looked into the mirror of the law of liberty, of God's will for his life, and a desire to please God, and he saw himself as he was and decided what he had to do for himself. Later in James, chapter 2, verse 10, Whoever will keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of everything. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now if you commit no adultery, yet if you kill, you will become a transgressor of the law. So speak you, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Now why is the word liberty there? It's important that it is there. It's there because of the temptation men have to use the law as a controlling element in the lives of other men. It's one thing to use the law to control your own life, or to direct your own life, to inform your own life, to see yourself for what you are. That's a wonderful thing. That's good. That's healthy. That's wholesome. But when a man takes the law of God and attempts to use the law of God to run another man's life, liberty is gone. It's no longer the law of of liberty. Now, can there be any question about what law he's talking about? You know, he that said here, do not commit adultery, also said you shall not kill. We're in the Ten Commandments, right? There's not much question about what he's talking about. He's not talking about some unnamed, invisible, or imaginary law. It's a real law and one that we know all about. How is it then that the, the law of liberty can be termed a yoke of bondage? Because there are many people who tend to do this. They look upon the Ten Commandments and other of the law of Moses as a yoke of bondage. Paul wrote to the Galatians, and just one verse for now, we'll come back to it. And he says, Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and don't become entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Well, now we know what the law of liberty is. We're not supposed to look at that, evaluate ourselves and our lives and direct our lives, and use it as a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Well, now, when Paul says then, stand in the liberty wherewith you are free, don't become entangled again with the yoke of bondage, it seems in, inconceivable he could be referring to the Ten Commandments in whole or in part as a yoke of bondage. And it is, is inconceivable. Is it possible, though, that the law of God could become a yoke of bondage? The answer, yes, it most certainly can. How so? when it is used by one man to attempt to control and direct another. If we're in a community, I'm in charge of this community, I'm interpreting the law, and I make certain demands on you people who live in my community that you will obey these laws, you will do these laws this way, and so forth, I can easily turn the law of God into a yoke of bondage for you to where it is uncomfortable, where you're miserable, where you, you have to ask even more questions about what to do until we can't don't even know how to move unless we consult the guy at the helm saying, may I do this, may I do that, or the other thing. Now, remember what I said. The yearning for freedom is as old as the desire to take it away. If you go back to the New Testament, this is not immediately apparent to most readers, I gather, because I hardly ever hear anybody look at it this way. 
The church very early on became sectarian. There were, within the church of God in the very earliest time, sects. There were people who believed one way, people who believed another. Now, in the very earliest time, for the most part, they were fairly used to that because that's the way it was in synagogues. You know, people didn't always agree on everything. And so the ability of us to sit down and worship God together, to wash one another's feet, to, to partake of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ together, did not require that we agree on every nuance, every possible aspect of doctrine, especially in view of the fact that we had not even come into contact with certain challenges that were coming down the road at us, things that we had never considered and never imagined we had, would have to consider. But God had other plans. He knocked a man down on the road to Damascus one day and converted him. His name was Saul. In the course of time, Saul wound up in, in Antioch along with Barnabas, and the Holy Spirit said, the church in Antioch didn't decide this, you know, cold. The Holy Spirit said, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work whereunto I have called them. So they prayed, they laid hands on them, and they sent them out. And what happened as a result of that was, as Paul went to synagogue after synagogue, he was rejected. As he turned from the synagogue to the Gentiles, the gospel was accepted, and Gentiles were being baptized in their dozens, probably hundreds, perhaps even thousands. Gentiles, non-Jews, uncircumcised, no, com no previous connection with the law of God, the law of Moses, or anything else. All right, back they come. They tell the church at Antioch all the news of their journey. Everybody's excited. Everybody's celebrating. Everybody's having a wonderful time. And all of a sudden, some guys show up from Jerusalem saying, you can't do this. You can't do this. And you'll find ourselves now in chapter X, chapter 15, in verse 1. Certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, we're not talking about entering into the Old Covenant. We're not talking about entering in, you know, circumcision was a sign of the Old Covenant, a sign of the covenant with Abraham, and of the right to inherit all the land from the Nile River to the Euphrates. That's what circumcision really was about in its origins. And it's only given to the children of Abraham, whether they're circumcised or whether they're not. But these people say, you can't be saved unless you're circumcised. And we're salvation. We're going way beyond any question of inheritance of a piece of land. We're talking about becoming heirs of the kingdom of God, being saved and forgiven of our sins, being given the Holy Spirit and able to walk with God and have a relationship with God apart from anything he ever any deals he ever cut with Abraham and Abraham's descendants. Okay. These people say you can't do that because essentially what they are saying is the faith of Jesus Christ is available only to the heirs of Abraham. That's their argument. Where Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them would go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about the question. Okay, we can't come to an agreement on this. Let's go down to headquarters. Let's talk to these people. Let's see what everybody down there has got to say. Being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenix and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles and caused great joy to all the brethren. Everybody, everybody, all the ordinary people were happy as they could be about hearing this. It was a sign of rejoicing. When they got to Jerusalem and were received of the church and the apostles and the elders, they declared all the things that God had done to them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, a couple of things here that you really should know. These people were of the sect of the Pharisees who believed. I presume they normally attended church assemblies in the church with the rest of the apostles and everybody else, but they had previously been of the sect of the Pharisees. And they came into the church and brought all that baggage with them. The baggage they brought with them was a particular form of Judaism. Not just all Judaism, but a particular form of Judaism which they believed. It was probably or among the most exclusive of the sects of Judaism. Perhaps the Essenes or the Qumran community were still more exclusive, but that's, they're really not anywhere close to the middle of Judaism. So these people, who were pretty much the strong party of Judaism at this time, a sect of Judaism, and obviously because they were in Pharisee, actually means a separatist, they separated ones, then they were exclusive. And this was their approach. God is our God. He is not your God. This is what it boils down to. God is the God of the Jews. He's not the God of other people. Go find your own God. We're going to keep God for ourselves. Okay. 
This was the argument that came up. Well, they discussed it. They thrashed it around. There was much disputing. And I have heard people oftentimes, well, disputing just means mild disagreement. I don't think so. I have a feeling there was a lot of raised voices on this occasion. These were human beings, and this was a crucial issue for the Christians, for the church, and everything that was coming. Well, they finally made a decision. Acts 15, James is speaking. He says, My sentence is that we trouble not them which among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write to them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses of old time has him in every city that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Now, I want you to consider something that you may have missed in that previous reading of what the Pharisees said. They said it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Catch that word? Command. When I said earlier, how does the, yoke, with the, word, with the, the law of God become a yoke of bondage? It becomes a yoke of bondage in the hands of men who are using it to try to control and command other people. Whereas James comes that back and says, no. He says, they can go into the synagogue any Sabbath day they can hear the law of Moses read, and they can decide. He didn't go on to say that, but it's implicit in what he's saying. They can come to hear and to know what God expects of them, and they can decide whether to do it or not. We don't have to command them to do it, because to command them implies discipline. What difference does it make if I command you to do something if I can't see to it that you do it? What difference would it make if we commanded you that you must do this or must be in Sabbath services three Sabbaths a month if we don't do something if you're not here? Command means we can require it of you. We can demand it. And that was what they intended to do. And down through history, in among Jews, among Christians, among Muslims, among everybody, there have always been men who wanted to command other people relative to the religion that they were following. Right? If you know anything about history at all, you know how true this is. And this is why he says, no, no, no. We are not going to do that. That's not what Jesus is all about. Here's how Paul described what was going on in one of his letters, a letter to the Galatians. And it's, he has some really strong things to say here, some things that many people misunderstand because they have no idea of the background that goes into this. They have no, no awareness that of, the, of the sharp distinction in the minds of all the apostles of God between the law of God or the law of Moses on the one hand and Judaism, and in particular Pharisaic Judaism, on the other hand, where men were using the law of God to control other people and to command other people and to exclusively keep their organization, their church, whatever it was, clean of people that they didn't like or that they didn't want. This is what Paul is dealing with. He's not dealing with the law of God. If you want to know what he thought about the law of God, read the book of Romans. He tells you again it's, it's good and perfect and clean and right and wholesome, that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. He has no problem with the law of God, the law of Moses, or with any of it. He knew better than any of us what Jesus said when he said, don't think I've come to destroy the law. I have not come to destroy it. I've come to, to fill it up, which he proceeded to do. Okay. Now, we understand this. Here's how Paul described what was going on. He says in chapter 1 of Galatians, verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you from the grace of Christ unto another gospel. It's actually not another one. It's not totally different. What it amounts to is a perversion of the, do of, of the gospel or the doctrine of Christ. It's a perversion of the true gospel, which is exactly what he ran head on to in Jerusalem with these Pharisees who said, no, 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 you've got to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. Paul later in chapter 2 says, 14 years afterward, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation and I communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. I did this privately among those of reputation. I didn't want to make any mistakes. But Titus, who was with me and was a Greek, nobody suggested that he be circumcised. And, of course, circumcision to him would have been pointless. He was a Greek. He didn't have the genes to be an inheritor of Abraham, much less anything else, so why circumcise him? But anyway, he says, we, we did this. We had to go up there because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came out privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Jesus Christ. 
That's a fascinating statement. They came in to spy out our liberty, our freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. Now, anybody who thinks that Paul's talking about freedom from the law is not paying attention. They haven't read Paul. They don't even begin to understand Paul. What Paul is talking about in terms of liberty and freedom is liberty and freedom from other men who keep on trying to tell us what we have to do, what we must do, what we must not do, from the demands of, of, of churches, organizations, structured, whatever you want to call them, who are trying to get control of our lives in Christ. That's what he's talking about, and that's what he's fighting against. He says, they did this that they might bring us into bondage. I think the NIV says that they might make us slaves. Uh, to whom we gave the place by subjection, no, not for an hour, in order that the gospel might continue with you. He said, we didn't do this. The gospel going to the Gentiles is finished. It's over. And, of course, we already know what God wanted done because he led us by the nose right through Asia Minor. And gave his Holy Spirit to all kinds of people as he brought them to the truth. So what are we sitting around here arguing about this, Paul wants to know. He then says later on in Galatians, in chapter 4, verse 16, Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? These people are zealous to win you over but to no good. What they want to do is to alienate you so that you will be zealous for them. Now, the choice of words and the way Paul puts this is done for the benefit of the Galatians. But what he's trying to tell you is these people are trying to cut you out of the herd so they can make you a part of their herd. I'm talking to people in Texas, so we'll talk cattle. We understand rustlers down here. Well, that's what they were doing. They were going to cut you out of the herd so that you can be made a part of their herd. They wanted to get control of you. That's the whole objective of what they're doing. Mind you, Paul has no bone to pick with the law. His fight is with Christian Judaism, which was a sect in the church at that time. Just call it what it is, Christian Judaism. The problem was not merely that people were teaching the Ten Commandments. They wanted to bring people under a command and control system of Christian Judaism, just like they had of their own among the Pharisees in Jerusalem. Judaism is a very different thing from the law of liberty. It's just not the same. And you've got to understand that when Paul is addressing this in Galatians, he has no bone to pick with the law. The bone is with Christian Judaism, a form of Judaism that had accepted and believed in Jesus as the Christ, but who still held everything else virtually intact. In chapter 4 of Galatians, he says, Now tell me, you people who want to be under the law, aren't you aware of what the law says? It was written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman, the other by a free woman. His son by the slave woman was born the ordinary way, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a promise. He was a miracle child. Verse 29. At that time, the son born in the ordinary way persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. Now, do you have any question what he's talking about here? He is now comparing the Jews, the Pharisees in particular, not just any Jews, but particularly those Pharisees who believed, those Christian Jews, as it were, who are trying to cause the problem in Galatia, he is comparing them to Ishmael, not to Isaac. He's comparing them to another son of Abraham entirely. And he is basically saying, just as Ishmael persecuted Isaac, even so these people are persecuting you and causing you trouble right now. And the Gentiles weren't sons of Abraham at all. But Paul uses the analogy, pulls the analogy in to try to make his point about what's happening here. Say... It says, get rid of the slave woman and her son. For the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance of the free woman's son. Therefore, brethren, we... Now, he's writing to a Gentile church. Remember this. This is not a, this is not a Jewish church. This is a dominantly Gentile church. He says, we are children not of the slave woman, but of the free woman. All he's done is just put an allegory, an analogy out to try to get his point across to these Galatians the fact that we don't need people trying to organize us into some kind of a unit so they can tell us what, they, what we're supposed to do and what we can do and what we can't do and thereby begin to slow the gospel down and hinder the Holy Spirit. We're not going to have that. And that leads Paul to the statement immediately that we quoted earlier. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and don't become entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, the, the funny word in here is the word again. 
Especially when you consider this is a Gentile church. What's he talking about then? About becoming a Gentile church, becoming entangled again, as at the first, with a yoke of bondage. Well, because what was beginning to happen right now in Galatia at the hands of Christian Judaism was exactly the same thing that had happened to them before in their Gentile religions. Because the spirit that wants to control people has been here since the Garden of Eden. It's been here right from the start. And it's not God's spirit. It is not God's way to control, to drive, to demand, to command. The commandments, the Ten Commandments of God, actually aren't even called Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. They're called Ten Words. And they are the testimony of God. And so that, that spirit which wants to control men, to put a bit in their mouth, to tell them which way to go, right, left, stop, go, that spirit is not the spirit of God. God's spirit is a spirit of liberty and of freedom, which includes the freedom to do wrong, the freedom to be stupid, the freedom to hurt people, the freedom to be hurt by people, right? It's freedom. What's it worth? For the founding fathers of this country, it was worth their lives and their sacred honor, and their fortunes and their sacred honor. Everything to them, freedom, was worth. <clears throat> One of them said, give me liberty or give me death. People grasping for power had tried to gain control of the Galatian church. And they were quite literally falling into the same old trap they'd fallen into as Gentiles a very long time ago. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. We're not going to do like Moses, who put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which was going away, basically meaning the glory in his face. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. But that veil is done away in Christ. Now, what are we talking about here? It's really strange. As Paul develops this, he almost sounds like he's talking negatively about, about the, the law, about Moses, about the administration of Moses, even, if you will. He says, even to this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when they, that heart shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, I can only come to one conclusion from what he's saying here, and that is that, <clears throat> that under Moses, as people read, the, the law was read in their ears, that they really weren't grasping what the point and the direction God wanted to take them was because they were not truly free. They were out of Egypt. They'd gotten to Mount Sinai. And in one sense of the word, you would say they were free, but they weren't really free until they got in the land. And they got their own land, their own vine, their own fig tree, their own plot, their own family where they could govern their own family, live their own life. That's when they really began to find freedom. He says, but we all, as in an open face, beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, as I said, it seems odd in the way that Paul would seem to speak so negatively of the Old Covenant. But the Old Covenant, as it finally came to be, not as it originally was. I think when Paul speaks of it, and you'll hear him, I mean, he sounds pretty tough occasionally when he talks about Moses, talks about the law, talks about the Old Covenant. I think he's talking about it as it finally came to be, not as it was God's intent for it to be. It became, for Israel, a form of bondage. And that's what Paul's talking about in that getting Galatians when he's talking about the allegory of the two women. Originally, Israel had maximum freedom. There was no king. There was no national government worth mentioning. The only thing I centralized, as I said, was the offering that was made at the tabernacle. I think when Paul describes the Old Covenant, he is talking about what it came to be, not what it was intended to be, and he is talking about what it will be again. Now, that brings me to Micah chapter, one, chapter 4 in verse 1, because Micah, looking way down into the future talks about a time when things will be different from what they are today. Micah chapter 4, verse 1. Behold, in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the, Lord, of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. It shall be exalted above the hills, and people will flow into it. 
And many nations shall come and say, Let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He'll teach us His ways. We'll walk in His paths. For the law will go forth out of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. God will judge among many people. He'll rebuke strong nations way off. And they'll beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Do you have any question about where, we at, where we're at, you know, when we start using language like that? Christ has returned. The kingdom has been set up. This is what the world would be like. And then he says, Every man shall sit under his vine and there under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. What he's talking about is a time when a man will have the autonomy to have his own property, his own trees, his own vines, his family about him, and be free to live his life before God without somebody lording it over him all the time. That's what he's talking about. Now, I want to take you back to Hebrews 8, because this is one of the more interesting chapters in the Bible that deals with this question of the covenants and why there was a problem with the old covenant that had to be dealt with. In Hebrews chapter 8, we read this. Now, the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. He's trying to summarize what he's done in the chapters preceding. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, not man. Now, again, he's starting already to, th to get us away from the idea of what men do. He's talking about the true tabernacle, not the false one. Not that the tabernacle was false, but it was, it was physical. I'm talking about, he says, the real one which the Lord pitched, not man. Every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. So it's necessary that this man have something also to offer. If he was on earth, he would not be a priest, seeing that we have priests that offer gifts according to the law, which suggests that the temple was still standing when this letter was written. They serve to an example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, said he, that you make everything according to the pattern shown you in the mount. But now he, that's Christ, has obtained a more excellent ministry by which he is the mediator of a better covenant established upon better promises. For, and this is a crisis here, if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have never been found any place for a second one. So there was something wrong with the old covenant. What was it? Finding fault with them. He said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, you have to go back and read the prophets to really understand what went wrong and how things went. Because, but the prophets are absolutely full of description of a corrupt judiciary, of the fact that a widow could not get her case heard before judges at that time, that a poor man was helpless when it came to trying to go to court to get anything done, that there was a whole system that oppressed widows, oppressed weak people, that just rolled right over the little guy. In other words, the whole system was set up from the top down to just roll over any kind of resistance, and it was basically run for the benefit of the people who ran it. The prophets are shot full of it. You don't have to go looking very far for it. You'll stumble onto it before you read very many chapters into any prophet anywhere. So consequently, they had, in their organizational structure, corrupted the Old Covenant by the way they dominated and rolled over the people. He said, I'm going to make a new covenant. It's not going to be like the one I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. They didn't continue in that covenant, and I don't regard them. They, did, they, they forsook the deal that God made for them. And you know, one of the places where they left that deal behind was when they went to Samuel and demanded a king. Right there is where they broke faith with God. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind. I will write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And there is no mention of a priesthood between the people and God other than, of course, Jesus Christ, who himself is seated at the Father's right hand. I will be to them a God, and they will be to me a people. We're talking about direct access to God, about the law being written into the heart. This text is pregnant with meaning. Notice he says, They shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me from the least to the greatest. 
You're not going to need somebody coming along and telling you, you don't know the Lord, you're not living right. You don't need someone to come along and tell you or direct your life having to do with knowing God. For everybody's going to know me, from the least to the greatest. I take this to mean direct access to God of every man, woman, and child on the planet. And direct access by God to them as well. The dependency on others to maintain your relationship with God is over. That's what he's saying. There will be no need for someone to teach or administer the law of God. The occasion for using the law to control people is gone. Because the law isn't over there on tables of stone. It's written in your heart. And they need no other intermediary. God concludes, or Paul concludes, God saying, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more. So, in that he says in New Covenant, he has made the first old, and that which wax decays and waxes old is ready to vanish away. Now, there is in all this a real conundrum to be solved, a real problem. The book of Judges is an exercise in that problem. Uh, repeatedly in the book of Judges, you won't need to turn to them. I'll just read them to you because they are significant. But there is this, this statement for Judges 17, verse 6. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did what was right in his own eyes. Judges 18, verse 1. In those days there was no king in Israel. In those days the tribe of the Danites sought an inheritance to dwell in. For unto that day their inheritance had not fallen to them among the tribes of Israel. Judges 19, verse 1. It came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel that there was a certain Levite. And he goes on with the Levite story. And the book concludes with after a terrible inc incident by saying in Judges 21, verse 25, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. Now, here lies the enigma. This is cited in Judges, and at nearly every place it is cited, it has to do with something bad that has happened, something outrageous that has taken place, some real screw-up on the part of a tribe, a people, or a circumstance that has led to bad circumstances. Inevitably, it seems to go that way. And yet, this condition, the freedom to do this, is precisely what God had intended for them. There was no king. That was what God intended. Every man was to have his own property. That's what God intended. Every man was free to do the right thing as he saw it. That's what God intended. He didn't intend for them to have to have people with whips that drove them to work. He didn't have, intend for them to have to have people saying, you better get rid of that, 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 that little sales booth you've got out here peddling your stuff on the Sabbath day, or I'm going to lay hands on you like Nehemiah finally had to do. That's not what God wanted for his people. He wanted them to do the right thing from the heart, not because somebody else told them they had to do it. Problem is, the result in Israel at the time didn't differ an awful lot from anarchy. That's just the way it went. And yet, when Israel came around and says, this isn't working, we need a king, God said, well, they have rejected me from being their king. You know, this reminds me a lot of the church in the 21st century. You'd have to be kind of, if you're not paying attention, you would, might not get it, but if you're paying attention, you will. There's confusion. There's chaos. You have every man doing what's right in his own eyes. And there are those who, just as the Israelites did, whenever they seemed to make sense to them, they decided that we should come under some kind of centralized authority to put an end to the confusion and put an end to the chaos eminently reasonable thing that the Israelites asked for. But if there's one thing that's clear to me, and I think you'll have to agree, any attempt to organize the church involves some degree of loss of liberty. Any attempt has to. Perhaps we're supposed to give up some small liberties in order to organize ourselves. On the other hand, Maybe we need to learn what it means to have one king only, and that king being Jesus Christ. Maybe that's the lesson that we need to learn. Paul, writing to the Colossians, it's in chapter 1, verse 12, said, Giving thanks to the Father which has made us meet to be partakers in the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin 
who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, in the earth, visible, invisible, whether they're thrones, dominions, principalities, powers. Everything was created by him and everything was created for him. Who? Jesus Christ. Everything was created by him and for him. And by him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Who's the head of the church? Jesus Christ. And nobody else. That's a hard thing to get through. Maybe our problem is that we haven't learned what it really means for Christ to be the head of the church. I'm beginning to think maybe we haven't learned that. Maybe we have confusion because, like the Israelites of old, we do what is right in our own eyes instead of looking to see to our true head to ask what he would have us to do. Maybe we have a problem because we lack respect for one another, and we are unwilling to allow Jesus Christ to lead another brother in the direction in which he should go. Maybe we have a problem because we lack the respect for the other brother's you know, right to make a decision and get hurt from the responses of it, if he needs to do so, if that's the lesson that Jesus wants him to go through and wants him to have. John, you know, was, I mean, Peter was walking along with, Peter, with Jesus on the Sea of Galilee not long, after his, not long before his ascension. And Jesus had really put, had him on the griddle, grueling him about, you know, Peter, do you love me? Simon Peter, do you love me? Simon Peter, do you really love me? And finally, after it was all over, when Peter turned around and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, following along, he says, Lord, what about him? What shall this man do? And it's very typical of us. We feel in the heat. Instead of looking at ourselves, instead of going to the mirror and looking and see what kind of people we are, we want to look and see what is God doing with this other person. And Jesus' answer is, if I will that he tarry till I come, what's that to you? You follow me. Maybe we haven't learned to respect the difference in our brother, the calling that our brother has, the way in which he believes Christ is leading him, right, wrong, or indifferent, because indeed if he is wrong, Christ is able to straighten him out, if he indeed needs to be straightened out. It isn't my job to do it, nor yours. Maybe we need to learn to allow other Christians to you know, follow Christ according to their lights without judging them. Whether we agree with them or not is not the point. What is the point is that we respect their right to do what they think is right. I really have come to the conclusion that one of the things the churches need nowadays is a good, strong dose of respect. Respect for one another, respect for one another's beliefs, respect for one another's rights, respect for whatever it is that it is, and to stop condemning one another looking down our nose with people. I can say this with confidence. To whatever extent we have confusion and problems, that is the extent to which we are not following Christ. Shall I make that point again? Because I said I can say it with confidence. To whatever extent we have confusion and problems, that is the extent to which we are not following Christ. Now, I never articulated this when I started CEM instead of starting a church. I realized, though, that if I started a church, I would end up taking liberty away from people. Oddly enough, being the selfish person that I am, I thought first about the fact that I would also be giving up a lot of my own liberty if I did that. That in the process of starting some new centralized religious organization, I would give up my liberty, I would take years away from you, and in the end of it, I don't think we would have done very well at all. In this season of independence, let me borrow a little from Abraham Lincoln. In the generations gone by, men and women of God have gone to their deaths for the faith that we now hold so dear. It is for us, the living, to be dedicated to the unfinished work which they have so far nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, and that we highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, and that this church 
under God shall have a new birth of freedom.